And John Lee has a Dharma talk where he talks about how big the Buddha was, big the Buddha is. He said that his body is so big they've been making images of it for 2,500 years and they still haven't made enough. His mouth was so big that his Dharma is still with us. His mind was so big he was able to not only teach the Dharma but also formulate the Vinaya. Put together a community that's lasted 2,500 years. And John Lee goes on to say, the Buddha's large size came from the fact that he was willing to make himself small. Cut himself off from his family, all of his comforts of life, went and focused his mind ultimately just on his breath, one small little spot. And was capable of learning as much as he could from that one small little spot until he totally understood it, totally mastered it. That was how his goodness then exploded out to fill the world as we see today. The same way when we meditate, we have to make ourselves small, both as we live in a community like this and as we practice our meditation. As we live in a group like this, it's, we want to make sure that the fact that there are many of us doesn't get in the way of each other's practice. And so one way of doing that is making your needs small, making your demands small. We have that chant reflecting on the requisites to remind ourselves how much eating is necessary and how much is more than necessary. How much attention to clothing and shelter is necessary, and how much is more. So that we're not wasting our time on excess, excessive food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. We're placing less of a burden on other people, the people immediately around us, and it spreads out in a large network. You have to realize that the food you eat comes through suffering. The suffering of animals, the suffering of farmers, the suffering of transport workers, the suffering of grocery workers, all the way down the line. And the same goes for clothing and shelter and medicine. So you want to minimize the suffering that you cause. The weight that you place on others. In your dealings with the people around you, you want to, again, have a small footprint. Think more of what you can give as opposed to what you can get. The Buddha says there are four qualities that help ensure that a, everything from a family to a larger society will stay together, hang together and be for the benefit of everybody involved. First is you learn to be generous. Generous with material things, generous with your time, generous with your forgiveness. The second is that you try to speak in a kind way. Even when you have negative things to say, you try to couch them in terms that the other person will be able to receive your message and not feel insulted, not feel belittled. not feel that you have contempt. They've done studies, psychologists have done studies, to show that the worst thing for any kind of relationship is contempt. There's that story of the videotapes that they make of couples, short videotapes, only a few minutes long. They hook them up to sensors that will sense their heartbeat and the sweat coming out of their palms whatever the signs of tension might be. And they put them on a videotape and have them talk about an, a minor item of conflict in the relationship. And then they go back and they watch the videos, slow them down so you can catch the micro-expressions. 
And they said they've been able to predict with a great deal of accuracy which relationships are going to last and which ones are not. The ones that are not are where there's the slightest hint of contempt or sarcasm, either in the tone of voice or in the expression of the face. So when you have negative things to say to other people about their behavior, try to do it in a way that doesn't indicate any contempt at all. That you're genuinely trying to help. You show this by the way you choose your words, by the way you choose your timing, when and where to say these things, so you're not embarrassing the other person. So kind words are the second principle. After generosity and kind words, then there comes genuine helpfulness. You see what the other person really needs, and if you're in a position to do it, provide it, you go ahead and you do it. You don't do it to make a good impression on them. You don't do it for their sake or for anyone else's sake. You do it for the sake of the practice, for the sake of developing your own goodness. You try to see what needs to be done, and then you go ahead and do it. One of the lessons I learned from my father is there are a lot of jobs that need to be done in the world that nobody wants to do. So they provide a huge, wide opportunity for you to develop your goodness with no competition. So look for those kind of jobs, those kind of tasks around the monastery or in whatever, wherever you're living. And then there's finally consistency, that when you're helpful, you're consistently helpful. When you speak kind words, you're consistently kind in your words, both to the person's face and behind the person's back. And these four qualities help the community to get along. Now notice, all of them re require a lot of input on your part, a lot of giving. Giving your time, giving your energy, giving a lot of thought to what you're doing and saying. So the best way to give is to learn how to make your own needs as small as possible. In other words, learn how to get the most out of little things, what you've got. As meditators, we're honest businessmen, businesswomen. Not dishonest ones. The dishonest ones are trying to make the most out of nothing. Whereas honest ones have a little bit, and they learn how to cultivate that little bit that they've got. So what have you got here? You've got the body sitting here breathing, you've got the mind thinking and aware. So you stick with the breathing. And even though you may, you may know that there are other steps further along the path, you make sure that you do each step well. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. This goes all the way back to that principle of nonlinear causality. It's the little tiny bits of your experience show the whole pattern of the universe at large. So instead of running around trying to sketch the universe, you try to get really well focused on one little thing. So you've got the mind focused on the breath. In the beginning, stay with one spot. Learn how to relate to that one spot in a way that doesn't squeeze it too hard, is not too loose about it. What's the right amount of pressure to bring to the breath? So that you can stay with the breath and at the same time not constrict the breath. And so you develop your sense of touch with this one spot. Now you may have to experiment to see what spot in the body feels best to stay concentrated on. In the course of the day, it might change. Well, learn how to be good at different spots, but always take just one spot at a time. And focus your full attention there. This is how little things get to grow. It's 
It's like starting a fire with a magnifying glass and a piece of paper. You go out into the sun and you concentrate on as much of the light of the sun on as little spot as you can. Focus very precisely, and you find that the paper will finally set on fire. The fire will spread to en envelop the whole piece of paper. In the same way with the meditation, try to get really well focused on one spot. You don't put so much pressure on it that it creates a sense of dis-ease or constriction in the body. You're trying to learn how to bring the mind and the body together in a way where they don't interfere with each other. The classic images of holding a baby chick in your hand. If you hold it too tightly, it's going to die. If you hold it too loosely, it's going to fly away. So find the right amount of pressure to bring to the breath, and then try to be as consistent as possible with it. And anything else that comes along in the mind, you can say, not now. Not right now. And if you do find the mind has slipped away, okay, don't engage in a lot of recrimination. This is one of those places where there's no shame and no blame. In other words, you're not here to prove something to yourself about what kind of person you are. You're not trying to prove to anything to anybody else. You're not doing this to be better than other people or to get in, engaged in all those old narratives about, well, you're, you're this way about everything. You can't even focus on your breath. You can't do this. You can't do that. That kind of thinking doesn't help at all. You're here to find out what works and what doesn't work. The Buddha never used guilt in his instructions. And the type of shame he used was not being ashamed of yourself as a person, but being ashamed of the idea of doing certain things that you know are wrong. That's it. For as, for, as for areas where you're still exploring, okay, there's, there's no shame and no blame. You're learning, trying to learn cause and effect. So you can clear away a lot of those attitudes as well. In other words, you're stripping down all the excess baggage in your mind as you find it accumulating around this one spot. So it's not just a process of staring at the one spot and not using any discernment at all. You've got to use your discernment in cutting away the obstacles, the distractions, the things that pull you away, whether it's an emotion or a thought, a memory, a distraction. If you can simply note that you've been distracted or pulled away and come back to the breath, that's fine. If you find yourself more entangled than that, then use your discernment to figure out how to untangle yourself. If it's an emotion, as we said earlier today, try to dissipate the, the physical charge of the emotion by thinking of the energy going out down your arms to the palms of the hands and out down your legs to the soles of the feet and out. In other words, don't keep it bottled up inside. And then when that initial wave of emotion has passed, then you can look at what's left. In other words, what were the narratives you were carrying around in your mind that allowed you to get triggered by that particular event that caused the emotion? Do you really want to carry those narratives around? Are they helpful? Learn how to question them create new, better narratives to replace them. Or better yet, remind yourself you're here to learn about cause and effect, pure and simple here in the present moment. And think about how the Buddha approached that. The first watch of the night of the night of his awakening, it was his personal narratives. You think you've got a lot of stories. Imagine all of his stories for how many aeons of cosmic expansion and contraction that he could remember. As John Fuhrung once said, it's good that most of us don't remember our past lives. We have lots of scores to settle. But notice the Buddha didn't go straight from that knowledge to the knowledge of the focusing on the Four Noble Truths in the present moment. He went through a second knowledge, which, to ask, which was to ask the question, was this just me that gets reborn like this? How about other beings? And he had that vision of the whole cosmos from Brahma's on down to the lowest levels of hell. 
and people being born in one level after having died from another level. And he began to see a pattern that it was in line with their actions, the things they did and said and thought under the influence of right views and wrong views. Once he saw that pattern, then he was ready to apply that pattern into the present moment. What intentions did he have in the present moment? What were his views in the present moment? What kind of views would help put an end to the intentions that kept him tied to the cycle of rebirth? And he finally came up with his teachings on the Four Noble Truths, that these were the right views, seeing things in terms of stress and its cause. The cessation of stress and the path of cessation to stress. In other words, seeing things in terms of cause and effect, skillful and unskillful. That was how he was able to approach awakening. Now notice, there, was, there were no personal narratives in that last one. But he got out of his personal narratives by stepping back and looking at the universe as a whole, seeing large-scale patterns. So if a memory comes up about something unskillful you did in the past, I think, okay, are you the only person who's done unskillful things? That's not the case. Even the Buddha did unskillful things. You read in the Jataka tales that not everything he does is pristine and pure. Yet still he was able to overcome his mistakes, get past his mistakes, and attain awakening. In other words, think in larger terms. That's why we have recollection of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as meditation themes for when things get dry or things get feverish in the mind. In other words, look for the larger pattern and then get back to the present moment in a less narratively charged way. In other words, try to drop as much baggage as you can. Strip away all these excess and unnecessary things. Not because you're a bad person if you hold on to them, but simply that it just doesn't help. It's a waste of time. Just stick with the determination to do things as skillfully as possible, even when you notice you've dropped your object and want to come back to it. Okay, try to do that in a skillful way which means you're willing to do it over and over and over again and not get flustered and not get upset, not get discouraged. And then when you've learned how to do one thing really well like this, then you can start expanding from there. You've learned the right amount of pressure to bring to the breath, the right amount of balance of stillness and questioning to bring to the breath to keep it in the the mind with its one spot in the present moment, then you can start expanding. Start expanding the breath throughout the body. Exploring the different ways that the breath energy moves. And then start exploring the other elements after that. Take things step by step. Don't try to gobble down too much at once. After all, we're trying to learn how to make the most out of little things. If you can't make the most out of little things, you're going to make a mess out of big things. Because the big things come from little things. That's their foundation. The same as when they teach you the piano. You start out with scales. It sounds boring. But the ability to play scales really well is going to show up in all the rest of your piano playing. So work on your scales. And one of the talents you learn working on your scales is how to keep yourself going even when it's boring. How to find interest in things that are not interesting to a casual glance. But when you look at them and get to know them, you learn about your hands, you learn about the muscles of your hands, the way your fingers go. There's lots of subtleties you can learn by sticking with little things, keeping things small to begin with, and be really, really, really observant. That's how the Buddha went from being very small to very large. 
And that's how the results of our practice can go from small to very large. by making sure that you do the small things well.